Well, I think it's very, very clear that we need a wider array of more effective treatments for PTSD, no question. MDMA was actually first synthesized and, and patented by Merck Pharmaceutical. They synthesized it in 1912 and patented it in 1914. So, but they never really did anything with it. And then in the 70s, Alexander Sasha Shulgin made some and tried it, experimented with it. And um, he and Dave Nichols published the first report of human experience with MDMA. And out of that um, grew the interest. Um, you know, he thought immediately this is probably could be useful as a therapeutic tool. But there were quite a number of psychologists, psychiatrists, other therapists using it kind of as a catalyst for therapy in the late 70s and early 80s. It was not a, an approved drug, but it wasn't illegal either. In 82, I came out to study with Stan Groff and Christina Groff at Esalen. And somebody came to the month-long workshop with MDMA. And at first I was unimpressed the way they described it because I thought it's not the, the bells and whistles and the whole lightning and all this from LSD or anything. It was just quietly helps you to talk to each other and feel your emotions. And, and I was like, I feel fine already. What, what do I need it for? But I thought I should buy some anyway <laughs> and give it a try. So I, I tried MDMA with my girlfriend and it was just a revelation about how profound it is. And at the same time, I realized that it was starting to be sold as ecstasy. So I, and it was also the rise of the Nancy Reagan Just Say No. So I knew that it was inevitably going to be crushed. So in 84, I started a nonprofit before MAPS that was the whole community together, uh, the, the therapists and the, the researchers. And, and so we had a chance where it was legal to try to build a base of support and witnesses for a potential legal case. And that's where I contacted Robert Mueller at the United Nations, the Assistant Secretary General, and he helped me uh, to meet a lot of religious professionals who I sent MDMA to, and they tried it in monasteries and all these places. And, and so we ended up, in, two, in 1984, the DEA moved to criminalize MDMA. And so we, I, I went to Washington and um, filed for an administrative law judge hearing, which to our utter astonishment, we won. And the judge said that MDMA should stay in Schedule 3. It should be illegal for non-medical use, but therapists and psychiatrists should be able to have it available to their patients. But then the DEA administrator overruled that and put it in Schedule 1. So that's where I started MAPS in 86. And the idea was that there is no way but through the FDA, that the drug war is too powerful, but maybe through science and medicine, we can make some progress. It's kind of an epidemic of PTSD now with all the veterans coming back from Iraq and Afghanistan to say nothing of all the countries where there's armed conflict and even higher levels of PTSD. So it's a huge public health problem. They're desperate. Last year was about five and a half billion dollars that the VA spent on disability payments for veterans with PTSD. I was a veteran in Vietnam from 65, 66, I was a Huey Battalion. And I came back with a pretty good case of post-traumatic stress disorder. And uh, it was really hard for a long time holding jobs, relationships and stuff. And uh, I saw this uh, thing on CNN about uh, using some of the psychedelics to relieve the symptoms and uh, I did it and it was wonderful. It really helped, uh, helped me get my feet back on the ground. From a kind of a therapeutic point of view, what we think it, it seems to do is kind of decrease fear and defensiveness, anxiety, um, increase a sense of trust, but also help people connect with their emotions. I think the National Geographic had a great analogy. It's like walking through a house and all the closets are open. Um, there's nothing you can't explore in your own psyche. And uh, yeah, it's just like magic. And the wonderful thing, you don't have to keep taking it for the rest of your life. Uh, our first study that we completed and published was with mostly people with um, childhood sexual abuse or rape. They all had to have had therapy and medications before and not not been helped adequately. And they'd have um, either two or three all day 
eight to ten hour MDMA sessions in our office with both of us, my, Annie, my wife and I present, male and female co-therapists is the model we use. So we just spend that whole time with them. So no, we don't give take-home MDMA. <laughs> they only get it under direct supervision. Among the people that um, got the MDMA with therapy, uh, basically 83% had a, a good clinical response versus 25% with the therapy only. Well, it's been 27 years so far. Um, and we're now about uh, two to three years away from what's called the end of phase two meeting with the FDA. So all of what we're doing is preliminary. None of the data that we are gathering now in our five or six uh, small pilot studies around the world will count towards making MDMA into a medicine. All that we're doing is trying to figure out how to design the phase three studies. And we anticipate, hopefully, that they'll start in around three years. They'll take four or five years. Again, it depends on resources and stuff like that, and then a year or so for the FDA to evaluate the data. So by the end of 2021, we're hoping that MDMA would be a prescription medicine. If this is in fact something that can help a lot of people, and the, we're at this stage of the research, which is um, you know, at least 20 years behind where it would be, if, people, if it had been guided only by science and not by politics and fears and other forces, that's really actually a, a travesty.